welcome you to a new series we're planning for uh, to feature rising poets in Marin County. Mm -hmm. And before we get started with your background and have you read a few poems, I was wondering if maybe you could help us bat around a few ideas for names for the show. The idea is we want to seek out and find new voices and nurture them through the show. Um, rising voices. I like rising voices. Rising voices. I think the simpler the better. Yeah. Yeah. Rising Voices is good because it, it gets the idea that we want to get across of people that aren't necessarily, I mean, you're kind of the exception and the mm -hmm. role here, but it's um, voices that are not yet, yet published or necessarily known in the world, kind of something to inspire young people and convince them that poetry is indeed relevant in their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that hearing about you and hearing about your work will, will go a long way mm -hmm. to doing Hopefully. that because <laughs> it certainly has inspired me. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with just a little bit of background. Mm -hmm. So tell us about where you're from and how you got where you are now. Well, I'm from El Salvador. I was born in 1990 in a small fishing village, La Herradura. And then there was a civil war that happened in the 80s. My dad left in 1991 when I was one. And then my mom left in 1994 when I was about to turn five. And then I was raised with my grandparents. And then I came here in 1999. And that's all of that. And my experiences in the United States since then drive my poetry. And that's what I write about in Unaccompanied. So how old were you when you came to this country? I was nine. Did you speak English? No. no. So you learned after you came to this country? Yeah, I learned it at Bahia Vista Elementary School oh, in the Canal. That's, that feeds right into my next question, because I know Marin viewers will want to know where you were educated, mm -hmm. where you hung out, where you live, that yeah. kind of thing. So, so tell I, us about that. I live in the canal, like two blocks away from Pickleweed Park. Mm -hmm. And I recently, I just wrote an article from Rain Magazine oh. that talks about my growing up there. And I used to walk to Bahia Vista, which was like four or five blocks away from my house. And then from Bahia Vista, I went to Davidson Middle School. And now I live closer to that part of San Rafael. From Davidson, I went to Branson. I got a scholarship. Uh, to go there. And from Branson, I got into UC Berkeley, so it's still, still local. And then I started writing and I got my MFA from NYU and lived in New York City for two years. Give us the time frame for that. When was that? I graduated Berkeley in 2012. Mm -hmm. And so from 12 to 14, I was living in Brooklyn uh, while at the same time that I was going to NYU. And then from 14 to 15, I lived upstate New York at Colgate University because they gave me a fellowship and then I was briefly back to New York City for like four months and then I got writing f um, residencies at McDowell and Yaddo and then while at Yaddo just in Saratoga Springs New York um, I was staying at uh, Sylvia Plath's room and then I got the call that I would I got a Stegner fellowship at oh. Stanford so I've been here for the past two years so from 20 2016 to 2018. Did uh, did Sylvia do a tombstone for that room? No, there no. There, there were no tombstones. No, that's McDowell. Oh, McDowell. Where, where, where they do the. Oh, that was at Yaddo. The wood, yeah. Oh, and right, that was at Yaddo. right, right. Yeah, so I've been very lucky. Yeah, yeah, you have. I mean, your rise on the poetry scene has been meteoric. I mm -hmm. would say. Um, we started working together when you were a junior in high school. Is that right? Yeah, like a senior. Yeah, so I come in to teach 18, a class. 17. Mm -hmm. what, what year was that? 2007. 2007. 2007, that's 2007. what I thought. And I remember encouraging you to apply to Breadloaf and Napa and places like that and, and seeing these other things as distant stars on the horizon, mm -hmm. never dreaming that you would reach yeah. them so I, quickly. And I had no idea that you know, there was this, um, these opportunities for writers. I didn't even know that poets were alive. Right. You know, so yeah, I thank you for making me apply to all those places and helping me. Um, and, yeah. Well, it's a universe. Yeah. It's a universe and, and a community, and there are lots and lots of opportunities. And one of the reasons we're doing this series is that we want to let people know there is support for them. Mm -hmm. If people who are really passionate like you and dedicated and interested in what they're doing, there is support for them, not only in Marin, but on a, on a national level mm -hmm. for pursuing these endeavors. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure I asked about in the beginning is uh, you have a very interesting tattoo, mm -hmm. I understand. Can you tell us about that? Well, when I was 
18, no, how old was I? I was 21. I published a chapbook uh, called Nine Immigrant Years, um, Nueve Años Immigrantes, and when I was 20. And I wanted me to keep a promise to keep on writing to myself and a tattoo. And I've always wanted to get a tattoo, but my mom never let me. <laughs> and, and I thought that that was a right excuse, like a, cel like a celebration almost. And I also wanted to celebrate one of the writers that inspired me and keeps inspiring me to write. And he's a Salvadoran writer and he passed away. Um, his name is Roque Dalton. So I got perhaps his second most famous poem that everybody knows. And everybody knows it because of Martin Espada and he did um, a anthology called Poetry Like Bread. Yes. And uh, so the poem where that comes from is Like You or Como Tu. I'm going to have you read that poem in a moment, but tell mm -hmm. me, because this interests me, what, what is his most famous poem? Um, it's pretty much the, every Salvadoran knows it, and it's, all, it's my, the epigraph to my book. Oh. And that one's a love poem, a Poema de Amor. And it's, um, just, it's an interesting poem because he just, is le he just lists stereotypes for Salvadorans, mm -hmm. but El Salvador has taken it like a pride and joy of like all these stereotypes, and, and most Salvadorans know that poem. How did you discover that poet? Um, and when? Uh, just Googling, because you introduced me to Pablo Neruda. Right. And that blew my mind. I was, there must be a Salvadoran poet. So I just Googled the early days of Google. So it's so El Salvador, it's like Salvadoran poet. And then his name kept popping up. And my parents know who he is. A lot of Salvadorans know who he is. Because he was one of the first people to be murdered during the Civil War. And this is before the Civil War officially broke out in the 80s. And a lot of people remember um, two events in the Salvadoran War, which is the first, the first one that a lot of uh, Salvadorans know, which is kind of like saying, where were you when JFK um, died? Well, where were you when uh, Monsignor Romero was murdered in church? And that was in 1980. So a lot of Salvadorans know that instance. But there was also this mythic figure that was Roque Dalton, and he was murdered in 1975. And, uh, and that like shook the country as well, because he was murdered by his own leftist um, oh. friends. So yeah. he's like the Lorca of El Salvador, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Well, why don't you, so the poem that is tattooed on your torso mm -hmm. is Como Tu, mm -hmm. Like You, by mm -hmm. Roque Dalton. Would you mind reading it in yep. English and in um, Spanish yep, for I'll read it. our readers? And then this is the, the book that um, Jack Hirschman helped uh, translate. Oh, yeah, he did the translation. I yeah, have. I did the translation, yeah. so... This is Jack Hirschman was the poet laureate in San Francisco and is a well-known fixture on the poetry scene. And, and in the leftist been. scene, too. He's a very diehard much, Marxist. Very much. And Roque Dalton was a Marxist. Yeah, he just well. released an anthology of Marxist poems yeah. Yeah. recently. So, this is the poem that's tattooed on my ribs. Como tú. Yo, como tú, amo el amor, la vida, el dulce encanto de las cosas el paisaje celeste de los días de enero. También mi sangre bulle y río por los ojos que han conocido el brote de las lágrimas. Creo que el mundo es bello, que la poesía es como el pan de todos, y que mis venas no terminan en mí, sino en la sangre unánime de los que luchan por la vida, el amor, las cosas, el paisaje y el pan, la poesía de todos. And this is the English version. Like you. Like you, I love love, life, the sweet smell of things, the sky blue landscape of January days. And my blood boils up and I laugh through eyes that have known the buds of tears. I believe the world is beautiful and that poetry, like bread, is for everyone. And that my veins don't end in me but in the unanimous blood of those who struggle for life, love, little things, landscape and bread, the poetry of everyone. Beautiful. That line, and that poetry, like bread, is for everyone. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? That everybody has the right to dream, and that everybody, for me, poetry has helped me it's the space where I can imagine a different world. 
And for me, that's what the line means. And that is also imagining and dreaming is a necessary part of life, like food and like bread. So I think that all these things are what human beings deserve. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to have you read a few poems, but before we do, I want to introduce readers to mm -hmm. your... This is Javier's first book. It came out very recently, September. a few months ago, September yeah. of 2017. Um, it's with Copper Canyon Press, which is a wonderful, wonderful poetry press that many poets would love to and have. And they publish Neruda. So I all found out about Copper Canyon through Neruda and, and the books that you used to wonderful. give me. Wonderful. Yeah. How wonderful. Anyway, I don't know if readers can see the cover, but there's a, a really bone-chilling and an eerily beautiful photograph of the wall on this. And um, are, are the poems in Spanish and in English? No, just no. English. Yeah. But do you have any of them in the Spanish that you're going to read today, or mm -hmm. are you just going to read in English? In English, yeah. Okay, and before we move on, is this book going to be released in El Salvador, or has it been? I'm working on a Spanish version, but there's nothing set in stone yet, but that is the dream. Are so. you going to translate your own poems? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Because yeah, I published a lot of those poems in El Salvador in Spanish, like in newspapers and stuff. You did? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to see that. I hope that happens. So I think what I'd like to do next is have you read, um, why don't you read three poems? Okay. And then we'll come back to a few questions. Okay. And I'll start with the poem that I start all my readings with. And I dedicate this book to my grandma. And I haven't seen my grandma since I left the country. And a lot we communicated at the beginning by writing letters. And so letters have a big um, influence or take a formal aspect in the book. And also phone calls. Just so. for context, how many years has it been since you've seen your grandmother? Since 99. Wow. So, 18. Know, yeah, 18. Wow. 18 20. years. Yeah, almost. But yeah, so this is Tu Abuelita Nelly. This is my 14th time pressing roses in fake passports for each year I haven't climbed Marañón trees. I'm sorry, I've lied about where I was born. Today, this country chose his first black president. Maybe he changes things. I've told mom I don't want to have to choose to get married. You understand. Abuelita, I can't go back and return. There's no path to papers. I've got nothing left but dreams where I am the parakeet nest on the floor de fuego the paper boats we made when streets flooded, or toys I buried by the foxtail ferns. Do you know the ferns I mean? The ones we planted the first birthday without my parents. I'll never be a citizen. I'll never scrub clothes with pumice stones over the big cement tub under the almond trees. Last time you called, you said, my old friends think that now I'm from some town between this bay and our estero, and that I'm a coconut, brown on the outside, white inside. Abuelita, please forgive me, but tell them they don't know. Love that poem. Yeah. Um, what's an estero again? It's the it's a bay. It's like, like a an marsh. estuary. Yeah. Like a, a brackish water, salt water, yeah. sweet. Where yeah. mangroves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a really moving poem. I think I'm going to have you just go ahead and read Good. two All of more poems. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll ask a few questions at the end. Good. Then this is Second Attempt Crossing. And the place where this poem takes place is the Sonoran Desert, so in the U.S.-Mexico border. And it's dedicated to Chino. Second Attempt Crossing. In the middle of that desert that didn't look like sand and sand only. In the middle of those acacias, whiptails, and coyotes, someone yelled, La Migra, and everyone ran. In that dried creek where 40 of us slept, we turned to each other and you flew from my side in the dirt. Black-throated sparrows and dawn hitting the tops of mesquites. Against a herd of legs, you sprinted back toward me. I jumped on your shoulders, and we ran from the white trucks, then their guns. I said, freeze, Chino, para, por favor. 
so I wouldn't touch their legs that kicked you. You pushed me under your chest, and I've never thanked you. Beautiful Chino, the only name I know to call you by. Farewell, your tattooed chest, the M, the S, the 13. Farewell, the phone number you gave me when you went east to Virginia and I went west to San Francisco. You called twice a month. Then your cousin said, the gang you ran from in San Salvador found you in Alexandria. Farewell, your brown arms that shielded me then, that shield me now from La Migra. And then, wow. I'll go to this other poem. So that one I try to, I try to humanize and show a different side of the portrayals of Salvadorans in the media, which tend to be gang members. Right. And completely dehumanized, very stereotypical, you know, just the tattoos, they're violent, etc. Right. But and, here, and even humanize gang members. Yeah. You know, aside from just equating all immigrants with gang members, mm -hmm. that poem actually hu lends humanity to are people to too. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, a martyr. Yeah. Someone who saved you. Yeah. And... So then, this is a, one of the poems that was published in El Salvador in Spanish, and it's much longer in the Spanish version. And I'll read the Where English. was it published in El Salvador? El Faro, elfaro.net. So that's actually the first online newspaper, in, notably in America. And they do a lot of really great work that is not biased or controlled by the government. Wonderful. Yeah. So if you want to learn more about El Salvador, they also publish it in, in English, so elfaro.net. And... This one is just titled El Salvador. El Salvador. Salvador. If I return on a summer day, so humid my thumb will clean your beard of salt. And if I touch your volcanic face, kiss your pumice breath, please don't let cops say he's gangster. Don't let gangsters say he's wrong barrio. Your barrios stain you with pollen. Everyday cops and gangsters pick at you with their metallic beaks, and presidents guilty. Dad swears he'll never return. Mom wants to see her mom, and in the news, black bags. More and more of us leave. Parents say, don't go, you have tattoos. It's the law, you don't know what law means there. But what do I know? We don't have green cards. Grandparents say, nothing happens here. Cousin says, here it's worse. Don't come. You could be stupid Salvador. You see our black bags, our empty homes, our fear to say the war has never stopped. And still you lie and say, I'm fine, I'm fine. But if I don't brush Abuelita's hair, wash her pots and pans, I cry. Tonight, how I wish you made it easier to love you, Salvador. Make it easier to never have to risk our lives. So that, that's an apostrophe poem. You're addressing El Salvador exactly mm -hmm. as if El Salvador were a human being mm -hmm. that you're having a conversation with. Mm -hmm. Very effective. I, I love that line, mom just wants to see her mom, mm -hmm. followed up by those black bags. Mm -hmm. Really effective segue. Um, so where can readers find your book? They can find it on Amazon. So but they should go to Copper Canyon they should go to, Yeah, <laughs> they should go to Copper Canyon. And I'd like to put in a plug for Book Passage, who launched your book. Mm -hmm. um, they have several of Javier's books, and it's wonderful to support our yeah, here locally, bookstores. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you are currently doing readings for this book. In fact, you just got off the plane and rushed to the studio from yeah. Chicago, right? Yeah. Uh, where is the most exciting place you've read for the book so far? Kentucky. Really? Yeah. Tell the, us about that. It was very unexpected. I had never been to Kentucky. I haven't. What uh, town? <laughs> they, they flew me into Lexington. Yeah. And one, the landscape was beautiful. I thought Mountain it was going to be flat, but it's like rolling hills. Ozarks. Green. Yeah. Um, horses everywhere. Yeah. And. It was Center College. They're like just outside of Lexington. Uh -huh. And there was, it was interesting because 
they flew me in. So it's like a small two college of 2,000 students. And they hosted me, and I was like the big speaker for the entire college. So it was a packed house. Oh, wonderful. And, and there was a small student, uh, like Latino student um, group that was beginning to form. So Is that who brought you out? Or they helped. You? Yeah, they helped. And, and then I also met with them privately. And unbeknownst to me, I, I gave, you know, I talked about myself and how, you know, the politics, et cetera, about Donald Trump and uh, his rulings on TPS and DACA. Yeah. And, and the students had already pre uh, prepared a sheet uh, given the phone number to call the representatives. And it was like this moment of like me speaking in a state, a red state, where I felt that I was actually doing the work that I hope poetry could do, which is convince mostly white Midwestern uh, students that immigrants are not as bad as the news say. Right. Yeah, and I had You're I got definitely the, doing that, Javier. And I got the best questions there because I had you know there was this two you know male white students were like wow I had no idea of that these things were happening. They they prefaced their questions by that, and for me that that was enough. I was like wow that you know you see me now, and you don't only see the news or like the statistics. You're actually seeing an immigrant. And I think that that's why I started writing. You're like Diogenes with the lantern. Yeah. You're, you're showing people. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. You're bringing the word. Yeah. And, and what's coming up? What's, are you going to be traveling for the next year or so? No. Uh, um, my, I'm packed until May. So it, it follows the academic year. So it's mostly um, colleges and universities that bring me out. And I leave Sunday. So I'm here today and tomorrow. And then I leave Sunday to D.C which wow. is the biggest Salvadoran hub in the United States. And so um, I hope that a lot of Salvadorans show up to my reading. And Where be, are you reading in D.C.? At different places, uh, at oh. a local um, bookstore. I'm reading at um, Georgetown mm -hmm. and, uh, and at a UC in D.C. program. So I, I don't know where they host it. But. Wonderful. Yeah. And then you go back to Stanford, and is your uh, term there done in the fall? Yeah. You, so you've been there two years almost. Two years, yeah. Wow. And yeah. then what are you doing after that? Um, I don't know, but I've applied to a lot of fellowships, and hopefully I land one of them. Good. Yeah. Good. So you can keep writing. Yeah. Are you still writing now, or are you too busy with all the books? No, I'm still. Planes are nice to me, and, yeah. I, and I actually do a lot of work on the planes. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Um, I want to make sure I get this question in, if no others, because this is a show featuring rising poets and mm -hmm. hopefully watched by rising poets. So you meet a kid in, in Marin who's in high school who's interested in writing poetry, and they want to know, they, they say, I want to do what you did. <laughs> what advice would you give them? What advice would you give to a young, let's say, high school poet who, who wants, like you have, to dedicate themselves to poetry and and be able to make it in some way. To read every day and to, if, well, first off, to question if they actually love it. And if they do, if they actually do love writing, then they should try to write every day. And that doesn't have to be the physical act of writing. Um, it could be just thinking about a poem or just reading a book of poems, or just reading anything, watching a film, but thinking of a poem, and using that film to like fill in the gaps. Yeah. Yeah, you said that to the kids at um, 10,000 Degrees of Separation. Remember when you did that workshop a couple mm -hmm. years ago? And that really struck me, the idea that everything you do in your life can feed your poetry. Like you, you told them, if you like watching movies, try watching some documentaries. Mm -hmm. And then when you're done, challenge yourself to write a little something about it. But it strikes me you could do that about anything. Yeah. You know, like I've been watching a lot of the Olympics. Maybe that could feed in in some way. Yeah. I, what you're doing feels like an Olympic event to me, by the way. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've been preparing for this moment for years, and you're flying all over the country, and it must be exhausting, but it must be exhilarating too. Yeah. How does it feel? I mean, you've achieved a success that is beyond what most poets can dream of, and you're 27 or 28? 28. 28. 28 years old. How does that feel? And is there any element of it that isn't all great? I still don't know. 
you know, I think I'm too close to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how he feels. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he feels great. Yeah. When you hear, you know, like going to Kentucky. I was just in Chicago and a young couple had given each other my book for Valentine's Day. Oh, and sweet. they showed up to my reading and they're oh. like 20. And that just, I was like, wow, you gave... I wouldn't think that this is like a Valentine's Day gift type of book, but they showed up and that, that was so stories like that make yeah. me feel great. Yeah. But they're also fleeting, you know, they don't last. And then the, on the other side is, um, you know, I get tired of traveling. I get tired of opening up about my story. Yeah. Um, and that's draining more so than the traveling, you know, the physical act of like getting on a plane. I don't mind doing that. But what does drain me is the constant opening up of something very personal. And, yeah. uh, and, and I, painful, I imagine, some of it, I didn't given think, the subject yeah, matter. I didn't think it was going to be as painful as it is. Yeah. I thought that, you know, I would have gotten a better hold of it. But that is what I think I have, like a tank that gets drained the more I do it. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that for people wanting to do this, it's important to read every day and write every day. Is it important to read poetry? Not every day, but is it important for them to read poetry as opposed to reading novels or newspapers or tweets or whatever whatever you people read now? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think ideally you should, in an ideal world, you would be reading poetry every day. But there are times that you can't, and that's okay. You know, I felt guilty for a long time that I wasn't reading poetry. And, you know, I, I went through a period, I go through periods where I read more fiction than poetry. I think that's okay. And I think it is too. Yeah. And I want to make it clear when I say you people, I meant you young people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> who are always looking at your phones. Yeah. Um, poetry is great for that though, right? Because mm -hmm. it's brief. And yeah. there are now, especially with Narrative Magazine and other organizations like that, people are starting to advantage themselves of that format mm -hmm. and the idea that you know sound bite size is what people really want right now poetry yeah. really lends itself to that do you feel like there's been a resurgence in poetry or do you feel that we're I still think, stuck in that in that stage of it doesn't relate to me in my life i think it's thriving i do too. I, I think poet we're going through a golden age of poetry and i just hope that people would acknowledge that more yeah and i think i hope that it lasts i think um Everybody can name a living poet now, and there are a lot of living poets, and I think young poets of color are, are really leading the charge at um, getting poetry into the hands of younger people. Yeah, yeah, they are. And they're doing it through hip-hop and rap and spoken word and also just really smart use of social media. I just found yeah. out about Rupi Cars, you know, who... Whether or not you like her poetry, she's done a great job of getting it out mm -hmm. and building a following of young people who are now looking at writing poetry is something they might want to do, yeah. which is that that's a good thing. Yeah. It's accessible now. You can reach it. It it's doesn't seem as far away as it was when I started writing, which wasn't that long ago. It was and only that's like eight partly years ago. from the technology, but it's also partly because of the infusion of new young voices. Mm -hmm. Because for a long time, poetry was just old, dead white guys, mm -hmm. a lot of English guys. And people were like, how can I relate to this guy roving over the moors? Mm -hmm. I don't even know what a moor is. But now people are writing about the streets and, and the suburbs. Well, not not and only the streets. Yeah. Well, the suburbs. Yeah. I mean, they're writing about life that we can all relate to. Mm -hmm. And it's this multiplicity of voices, I think, that mm -hmm. is really dramatically changed. And I think it's tremendous, mm -hmm. personally. I think we're getting close to the end of time. I'm going to ask one more question before my last question. And that is... Okay, so I know you, so I know that for a long time you were thinking about being a history professor and mm -hmm. that history was very important to you. So what do you see as the relationship between history and poetry? Well, I wanted to be a historian because in El Salvador we actually didn't have a history major at, at, a, at a major university. So no, there was no history in El Salvador. In, in, like you couldn't go to a university to become a history professor wow. until 20, 2011. So that has changed. Mm -hmm. But when I started, when I was in college, that, was, that fact was like, wow, yeah. that's, that doesn't feel right. Yeah. And also, I wanted to honor the lives of my parents and what they went through and the lives of many Salvadorans, which is a big reason why we are in this country. And that's because of a US-funded civil war. Um, so poetry um, is very much 
for me, it's, it's almost like a historical document. The, the stories that I've included in the book, it's almost their testimonies. And it was important for me to include the voices of my parents and what they went through in the war, because there's a lot of, um, by the, so um, out of all the Salvadorans that came to the United States that applied for refugee status, only 2% got it. And I think there's a lot of disbelief by the U.S. government of the, of, or lack of proof that you need to prove in order to receive a refugee status. And I think poetry, oral histories, should also be considered proofs and as documents. But the U.S. immigration system does not believe that. So that is where, for me, history and poetry collide. So you're a poet and a historian. Yeah, I hope so. And I guess poetry in some ways can augment or even correct the, the visible tactile historical record that has been created by the survivors. Mm -hmm. um, I know Camille Dungy believes that. So we're almost out of time, and I want to ask that time-honored question of how you'd like to be remembered. Mm -hmm. What do you want people to think of when you're gone? And I think you have a poem that answers that question, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a poem that I usually read at the end of my readings. And um, I wrote it in not a not so pleasant time of my early 20s. And I took the form from another um, poet that I'm very inspired by. His name is Etheridge Knight. Oh, and I've read him. I have mm -hmm. a book by him. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's a great poet. Not that poem. well known, but really tremendous. Yeah. Bay Area poet, right? No, oh, no. I he was. He's uh, from, um, I don't know where he's from. But I think Indiana. Yeah, I found a book of his poems, a used book in a bookstore once. He's yeah. something. Anyway. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so he wrote a poem about um, what people should do for his funeral. So I found that very inspiring. And I hope that people do this at my funeral. And Estero de Jaltepec is the, the bay where I was born, where I grew up. And I think that's all you need to know. And Como Tu is referenced the poem that I read by Rucka Dalton in here. Perfect. So I want that to be We have a ring construction on there the show now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is instructions for my funeral. Don't burn me in no steel furnace. Burn me in Abuelita's garden. Wrap me in blue, white, and blue. A la mierda patriotismo. Douse me in the cheapest gin. Whatever you do, don't judge my home. Cut my bones with a machete till I'm finest dust. Wrap my pito in pennies so I dream of pisar. Please, no priests, no crosses, no flowers. Steal a flask and stash me inside. Blast music, dress to impress. Please be drunk, miss work y pisen otra vez. Bust out the drums, the army strums. Bust out the guitars, guerrilleros strummed. And listen to the war inside, please. No American mierdas. Carouse the procession dancing to the pier. Moor me in a motorboat. De veras que sea una lancha. Driven by a nine-year-old son of a fisherman. Scud to the center of the estero de Jaltepec. Read como tú and toss pieces of bread. As the motorboat circles, open the flask. So I'm breathed like a jacaranda, like a flor de mayo, like an alcatraz. Then forget me and let me drift. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. And you inspire me every day. Yeah. You really do. And I hope through this show you can inspire some other people too. Yeah. Thank you, Becky. Thank Thanks. you for hosting me. <laughs>